and Namaste. And, uh, it's very nice to see an extremely young and enthusiastic crowd today. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, I'd like to thank the young uh, organizers of TV Kathmandu for giving me a platform to reach you. And I'll talk to you about my experiences in the field of cataract surgery, particularly how cataract surgery is taken into large communities, not only in Nepal, but globally. And uh, let me explain to you about cataract, which in the body is called Muthi Bindu. You know? This is one of the commonest surgical procedures taken in the world. You know? If you look at the, uh, a surgical, specific surgical procedures, but this is one of the commonest surgical procedures done in the world. And it is said that the disease of cataract actually shortens your life expectancy and reduces your income. And uh, there's a less chances for employment. Employment opportunities are less. And the authority in the family and society is less. And uh, it does increase the burden. And we know that there are about 285 people, million people in the world who have regions which are impaired, disturbed vision. And of that, 9 million are actually blind. Can you hear me on the back? Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, of these blindness, 80% are avoidable, either curable or preventable. And uh, again, unfortunately, bulk of these live in the Asian, Asian continent and sub-Saharan Africa. Cataract, going specifically to cataract, and uh, increases with population and increases with longevity because it's an aging disease. And uh, we believe that by 2020, number of cataracts actually go double. And uh, but unfortunately, the burden is much higher in the poorer countries. And uh, it is said that about 121 million people globally need surgery every year, of which we do less than 25 million right now. Now, going back to my personal involvement, when I came back from the All India Institute of Medical Science as a very young, fresh ophthalmologist in Nepal, and uh, with a lot of strength and enthusiasm, and seeing how to do a lot of work, I came back to this country and I found that the surgeries which were conducted at that time were much less. But much, much more than that is the surgeries were done without using intraocular lenses. And you're left with patients wearing very thick pop bottle glasses. The problem with these glasses were it produces extreme incoordination particularly if you understand the topography of Nepal. And I found in many instances, it is impossible for a person to have cataract surgery and wear the glasses and walk in the kind of, uh, you know, places that we live in Nepal. Even for daily purposes, you need extremely good vision to go to your nearest, whatever you want to do. No, you need extremely good vision. You have to go down and up and, you know, and lights are not good, so. and. Also, it was found that 60% of the operated patients were virtually found without glasses, so they were functionally blind. And actually, what you were doing surgery was not good. And uh, the 6 percent cause of blindness we found during the survey, nationwide survey, was uh, because what we call, use the term called iatrogenic, was caused by bad surgery. So 6 percent was by bad surgery. So I was totally taken back, numbed and confused <coughs> with doing the most important part of our service uh, in, in our specialty, which is the cataract surgery. And if you are doing cataract surgery in instances where the results are so poor and you are giving so little after surgery also, then what is the use of doing that surgery? And, uh, 
I determined to myself that cataract surgery was actually has to be an initiative to provide sufficient, successful, and sustainable surgery, which should be modern cataract surgery, and there should be no second class vision to patients that you treat. I think vision has to be first class to everybody. And uh, we are both challenged and uh, also privileged to be in this branch because vision is such a, you know, uh, you have, you cannot give lesser vision for somebody else. Yeah. So I always believe that visual needs should be the same standard for poor and rich both. And, uh, but then there was tremendous inequity, but still there is inequity. And, uh, we sat down with a group of Middle East entrepreneurs and uh, some friends and uh, with a total purse of 28,000 rupees in 1992. Just with that money and some wild dreams. So looked carefully at the barriers of what I wanted to achieve in the community. And I found the barriers were barriers to provide high quality, modern, very good surgery in patients that we are treating with. Treating to. One barrier was the cost of intraocular lenses, which was much higher than $100 at that time. And the adaptation of the surgical procedure which was done in the West to suit our, our conditions, not compromising on the quality of course, and cost and complexity of the equipment. So then we started really on a three-prong attack. And uh, it was at that time that I met a gentleman called Fred Hollows, and uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, we shared uh, very wild dreams. And he used to be a professor in the University of New South Wales in Sydney, in Australia. And uh, he had, he had already had some frame uh, doing some work in the Aboriginal community in Australia, and. Uh, so I shared him the, my dream of cataract surgery and uh, when he came to look at patients with trachoma in Nepal. So together we decided that we'll, do, we'll try to do something. And uh, the first thing was to manufacture these intraocular lenses. And when we started the concept of trying to manufacture intraocular lenses in Nepal, a lot of our friends and colleagues thought that we were mad. How can you do such sophisticated highly specialized manufacturing thing in a place like Nepal. And, but to combat the number one barrier, the cost of the intraocular lens, the only way we found at that time that the raw material of the intraocular lens was actually about 50 cents. So we were puzzled and you know really from 50 cents, you're making $150. So why don't we manufacture the lens here in Nepal? So we started with the concept, and of course we struggled. We struggled for five years. We had a lot of political, financial, social problems, you know. But uh, anyway, we finally were able to manufacture lenses. And uh, these lenses uh, were manufactured locally and uh, they still continue to, we still continue to manufacture them in a much larger scale. Yeah. You can imagine the cost came down to $4 from $100. And uh, what this did was, this took the surgical procedure to be made possible to a large target group from a few hundred to a few million people now. And uh, another challenge at that time was uh, for us, uh, when we said this is made in Nepal, and uh, people in the international community was, uh, you know, they wouldn't believe that it was made in Nepal. <laughs> so we had lots of problems. And uh, we started doing a lot of advocacy. Can you make lenses in Nepal? Intraocular lenses, lenses that goes inside the eye, stays in the eye lifelong. Can you make those? Can you make those of the standard of what we make here in America or 
Europe. So those challenges, you know. And then we finally uh, came out with the concept of since medical devices had no standardization in Asia and in Nepal at that time, we started with the concept of ISO 9000. And we were one of the first manufacturing base which started with the concept of ISO 9000 certification in 1995. And now we are CE marked. And these are done audited and re audited by the HGS in the UK every year. So we have to live. And uh, you know, my philosophy is that the lenses which comes out of this has to be, each lens has to be of top quality, if not better than the best one in the world. Because it has to go in your mother's eye or in my mother's eye. So they have to be absolutely no compromise on the quality. The other aspect was to attack the surgical technique which was present and available in the West at that time. So we started working on adapting the surgical technique which normally used to take about 45 minutes to one hour in West. And for us to do that long procedure for so many patients is impossible. So we started looking into, you know, into the depth of all these things. And uh, now removal of cataract is very simple. And uh, but you have to insert an intraocular lens to give patients very good vision, as uh, against what they used to get with very thick glasses, you know. So we started. We disappeared into the bush for about five years. We took surgical techniques to different parts of Nepal and uh, this is, we were operating when Mustang had just opened up for the foreigners way back in the early 90s and uh, we were operating in a small veterinary clinic in a place called Charan and uh, those days we used to operate with bare hands, you know, no gloves so that was the way we used to do it but uh, so we started looking at different microscopes, surgical microscopes available, how we can bring down the cost and how we can still maintain the quality and uh, uh, see how we can actually do the whole system of work for communities like in Nepal and other places. So after five years, we had evidently, demonstratively simplified, adapted and tested and, uh, and then these were published in international medias and, uh, and presented in uh, international conferences and we started training in Nepal and the training became extremely popular and we started taking it globally then. The surgical operating procedure manuals were published and with the Fred Hollows Foundation, Fred Hollows died much before we started the work. And we established this foundation back in Australia, which now works in about 35 countries and raises every year about $50 million for prevention of blindness work. You can see how a small you know, uh, phenomenon can create uh, a global uh, attention. And uh, there's another organization called the Human and Cataract Project, which is based in America. This also was started at Tilganga with a friend of mine called Jeff Tabin. Now again works in many other countries doing similar kind of work. So we started with the concept of high volume ambulatory surgery. Ambulatory surgery in 1994 was very foreign to this part of the world. Ambulatory means you do the surgery and send the patient home. Those days uh, patients were operated, left for seven days, not move, nothing. So we started with this and we started with a concept of cost recovery where patients who could afford to pay will pay and patients who have less money will pay less. Patients who had no money will not pay but get the same quality of treatment, subsidized, you know. So surgical modification production line approach was uh, this is more or less like the production line approach where the surgeon becomes one part of the production line and you involve the 
the whole team to do this procedure. So this is a group of doctors and paramedics being trained in China now. So finally, we come out with what now is very popular, known as manual small incision surgery, and which is utilized and uh, which is practiced in many parts of Asia, Africa, South America, and even in developed countries like America, Europe, Australia. If they get a very mature cataract, they go back to this technique. And it's simple, low cost, but the outcomes are very good. And uh, we had to prove to the world because we are virtually working with the science. So we had to do a clinical trial comparing this with the best available technique in the world. So we had Dr. David Chang, who's now the cataract and surgery, refractive surgery uh, president of America, who practices in California. He came here and uh, he did one series and we did one series. We compared the results and the results were comparable at the end of one year. Two surgeons sitting side by side can do about 150 cases very easily in one day. So the other part was to look into the equipments, you know. So we were initially involved in developing some of the low-cost microscopes and laser machines. I really believe that innovation, innovation is trying to do something different from the convention. Always, always, never think that if you're given a technique, never think that it's an established technique. Always try to question yourself and say, is there something different I can do? That's, I think, that's from there innovation actually comes out, you know. And you really need a strong team, good base, and a very positive advocacy. This is very important in developing countries like ours uh, to, uh, you know, this is positive efficacy has a lot of meaning, but I think basically it helps you to move forward in political and social uh, uh, obstacles. So we finally uh, established the Philippine Institute of Ophthalmology. Yeah. Now this is uh, uh, almost a world-class training center where I feel proud as a Nepali that we train almost everybody from the world to come here. They, whenever they want to see something in the eye, this is one of the stops for them to come. <laughs> the architectural outlay, the building, and uh, everything has been done so that there is an efficiency in the patient management, and there is a demonstration, there is teaching, you know, this is the surgical intraocular lens manufacturing facility. And uh, very recently, we are one of the first uh, companies in the developing world where these lenses are being, will be used in Australia with TGS certification. This is the small lenses, we call them as jewels, you know. Mm -hmm. And we do a lot of work outside. This is our team doing work in Indonesia in 2011. And this is working in community in somewhere in Nepal. And our community commitment is for a large group of unprivileged people, but that always the commitment is always to provide the best for each individual. And then we have an eye bank. And uh, must be one of the fewer eye banks where a uh, collection of corneas is used at the crematorium. I don't know how many of you have seen it, but we have a cornea exercise center right at the crematorium, and nowhere in the world there's a facility like ours. So always think differently. There must be some other ways to do something else, you know? So if you look at the cornea exercise center, which is at the crematorium in Paspati, it's not written in the books, it's not found anywhere in the world, but it's something that's very applicable to our uh, our way of dying, and our way of society, our way of religion. This is cornea transplantation surgery being conducted uh, with the donor cornea. 
training programs being done early on in Vietnam, in China, in Thailand. About more than 100 doctors in Thailand are using our lenses and our system. This is in uh, the DPR Korea in 2006. And uh, we are one of the countries where we help them totally in the prevention of blindness of the, uh, blindness of the country. And every year, our team members go and visit them. Every year, they have more people coming in. So in the last 10 years, we have substantially raised the number of cataract surgery and the quality of cataract surgery. And uh, this is not politics. This is simply to looking at people who are blind and trying to see what best you can do to them. This is in Indonesia, again. These are some of the countries that we are uh, working closely with. And uh, this is a school teacher who thought she was never going to teach in our school. And uh, she's uh, crying out with emotion once she sees the next day after the bandages are off. This is our country from one of the hills in Nepal. You can see her before and after surgery. And, uh, it's a very personalized, but you know, there's a lot of, uh, 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 lot of effect. And uh, I think it's very, uh, very important for you to understand, for me also to understand the personal stories, because that gives you, that gives you charge all the time, you know? This is a patient that we had an opportunity of doing in Mount Kailash in a place called just at the bottom of Mount Kailash called in, in Darchen. She was a, a People's Liberation Army uh, in the way back, you know, in, in, the, in the time of uh, Mao. So after her eyesight being restored, this was Min Bhadra and we thought he was dumb and deaf when he was blind. And we actually found he could speak after seeing, being seen, you know. And uh, this gentleman, we thought he's about 90 years old. And just after one day of surgery, <laughs> and the training programs are conducted. We work very closely with our fellow human beings around the world. And uh, I feel very proud to be a Nepali, to go into these places and tell them what Nepal is all about. And, uh, and you know, say that in Nepal there are some things which are done which can help people. So it's a very difficult thing, you know, with, with so many things going wrong, it's not very easy for you to go like that. And uh, of course our team, this is our team who works very constantly uh, behind you and with you. And, uh, I really feel that uh, problems and solutions both can cross geographical boundaries uh, in 21st century. And uh, thank you very much for listening.